Hello, I'm Dr. Melina Ballin from the University of Minnesota. I'm a professor of pediatric endocrinology and surgery. I will be speaking today on protect, protecting insulin producing beta cells after transplantation, talking specifically about anti rejection medications uh, to other strategies, including tolerance, induction, and encapsulation to avoid chronic immunosuppression. I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of background about the current state of islet transplantation. Most islet transplants have been uh, cadaveric donor islets obtained from a deceased donor and then transplanted into a patient with type 1 diabetes. Uh, this is done largely under clinical trials uh, under FDA regulation in the US, but it is available as a clinical procedure uh, in certain areas of Europe uh, and Canada. The goal here is to restore endogenous insulin production. In this procedure, the pancreas was resected from the deceased donor and transplanted into the uh, recipient. Uh, the islets are isolated specifically and transplanted into the portal vein of the liver. This is done either by a small uh, incision, a mini laparotomy with infusion of the islets into the portal vein, or through a uh, interventional radiology guided approach. The islets then engraft in the liver sinusoids and start to function over a period of weeks to months. But in order to protect and maintain function of those islets, patients must be on immunosuppression to prevent a recurrence of autoimmunity and alloimmune rejection. And largely because of that immunosuppression, islet transplants have been restricted to patients who have high risk type 1 diabetes. And that is specifically in most cases defined by either patients who are having very labile blood glucoses or a, a quote-unquote brittle form of diabetes complicated by severe hypoglycemia, or they have had a kidney transplant and already require immunosuppression, and typically they are insulin-sensitive, non-obese individuals so that you can get enough um, islets to function and um, provide the body's insulin needs. Now, under those circumstances, uh, islet transplants are very successful. Uh, the majority of patients have resolution of lability and severe uh, hypoglycemia, and at experience centers, 80% or more may come off insulin, although sometimes it requires uh, two islet infusions uh, to get enough islets. Again, all patients are placed on immunosuppression currently um, with our current therapy, uh, and this consists of two uh, components, an induction immunosuppression component and maintenance. Induction is typically with a T-cell depleting agent like ATG or alemtizumab or sometimes with an IL-2 receptor antagonist like bezaliximab, and often a TNF-alpha inhibitor is given at the same time to block innate immunity. Um, this is short-term in the peritransplant period, but then patients must also be kept on maintenance ther therapy for as long as the islets continue to function. Uh, and that usually consists of tacrolimus or sometimes cyclosporin combined with an anti-proliferative agent like mycophenolate or sirolimus. The choice of immunosuppression does matter in outcomes, and particularly so in long-term outcomes. Uh, so the figure on the right here shows data from whole organ pancreas transplant in the red, and two groups of islet transplant recipients in the purple uh, who received T-cell depleting agents and TNF-alpha inhib inhibition for their induction immunosuppression compared to patients who received only IL-2 receptor uh, antagonists for induction in the blue bars, showing in Insulin independence is better long term when a more ideal induction regimen is used. Uh, more recent results have also shown better long term outcomes when sirolimus and calcineurin inhibitor maintenance, like tacrolimus, is used in combination. Unfortunately, the problem with long term immunosuppression is that. Uh, it has a risk of side effects and complications. So this immunosuppression is fairly equivalent to what someone would get if they were getting a whole organ pancreas or other solid organ transplant. So patients must be monitored very closely with routine labs and clinical examinations, looking particularly for serious side effects like bone marrow suppression, particularly leukopenia, uh, infection risk, including monitoring for EBV and CMV viruses that can have significant 
significant complications in transplant recipients, monitoring kidney function, particularly in those on tacrolimus, and monitoring for um, skin cancers and other malignancy. In addition, patients oftentimes have minor um, but bothersome side effects like GI symptoms or mouth ulcers that must be managed. So while this uh, immunosuppression risk is justifiable for those patients who have complicated forms of type 1 diabetes and are having hypoglycemia, in order to bring this to a larger uh, transplant audience, uh, a larger group of patients with type 1 diabetes, we need to be able to minimize or get rid of that immunosuppression. So while that's not available in the clinic right now, there's many strategies being developed. Uh, those include um, work on tolerance, where we would actually retrain the immune system to recognize the islets as part of self. Uh, this might include using T regulatory cells or sort of a negative uh, vaccine uh, approach to retrain the uh, immune system. Gene editing of donor cells. Now, this becomes particularly um, an option when you have um, stem cell derived islets like are being uh, uh, translated now into the type 1 diabetes setting that you might be able to gene edit these uh, uh, cells to make them less responsive to the immune system or encapsulation strategies. Now, encapsulation strategies are um, under clinical trial right now and can um, take a few different approaches. Um, so a macro encapsulation strategy puts multiple islets in one capsule. Uh, these are uh, retrievable, which is uh, appealing and immunoprotective, but there's a very thick diffusion barrier. Micro and nano encapsulation um, encapsulate a single islet at a time and are a little bit thinner, but still there is a uh, challenge in terms of the thickness between the islets and the blood vessels uh, that can lead to hypoxia or problems with diffusion of glucose. Uh, or insulin across to the cells. Another concept is to apply an open biosaffold where local um, uh, immunosuppression or trophic factors could be placed to protect the islets. These are all in development, but will be really important to bringing uh, stem cell derived islet therapy and renewable cell sources to a larger uh, patient population with type 1 diabetes or other forms of diabetes. So, what do you need to know for, with, for your patients with type 1 diabetes right now in the clinic? Cell therapy for diabetes is limited currently to patients who have type 1 diabetes complicated by severe hypoglycemia or who need immunosuppression for a kidney transplant. And this might be a clinical procedure or clinical trial, depending on your setting. However, approaches to reduce the immunosuppression are currently under development, including encapsulation, tolerance induction, and gene editing. And these would greatly improve safe access to islet therapies, including stem cell-derived islet transplants for more patients with type 1 diabetes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.